All right, let me welcome you this evening to Faith Baptist Church. We're glad you're here and excited to have a good time in the Lord and the study of His Word. Let's all stand together. Let's take a hymn book, turn to hymn number 630. Hymn number 630. What a friend we have in Jesus. Brother Nick, come and lead us. Good to see you this evening. All right, round two. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often On the third, are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with the load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do Thy friends despise, forsake me. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and sheep thee. Thou will find the solace there. Let's pray together. Our Father, again, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. And we bring before you those needs we mentioned this morning, the love family, we pray for them and certainly pray for Jay Bird. And Lord, pray God that you'd watch over him in his surgery coming up this week. We pray for Brother Michael Thomas. And God, we ask for your intervention in his life. And Lord, that you'd surely raise him up off that bed to serve you and continue to preach your word. Just have your will and way in our service tonight. We pray for Brother Earl tonight as he's preaching down the road. Lord, bless him and use him. We pray that souls will be saved and Christians will be strengthened and edified and your people will be stirred and moved into a closer walk with you. Bless our time together around your word. We'll thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you can be seated, turn over to hymn number uh, 500 and, uh, let's see, I can't hardly see that. Uh, 581, I believe, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm the last. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, the Savior friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me too. How I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Thank you.
Thank you again, Brother Nick. Just by way of announcements, remind you, Brother Earl is preaching down the road this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 7 o'clock at the Pigott Branch Baptist Church. And I would encourage you to go and support him if you can and uh, just uh, give a good hearty amen <clears throat> if you hear him preaching in there. Uplift and encourage those folks with your spirit of enthusiasm as well. So pray for him this week. Also on Friday night of this week, uh, we'll have our sports banquet. I believe uh, our presentation here in our auditorium, that'll be at 6 o'clock on Friday evening for our Christian school. And then the following Thursday, the 13th of May, will be our kindergarten graduation. And then Friday, the 14th, will be our senior graduation. We're graduating uh, five seniors, three that are in school here every day, and two that are homeschoolers that are going to be a part of things. So I want to encourage you to come, even if you don't have kids in school, maybe they're not graduating, come and support the service, see the celebration, and watch as we announce that, uh, uh, those seniors. We'll also be awarding uh, the Leon Strohmeyer Memorial Scholarship. Every year, many of you know that we are uh, able to give out a $10,000 uh, scholarship uh, to one senior each year. We'll be making that presentation on senior night, and uh, so we're glad to have that opportunity and privilege. Uh, all going back to Miss Gail Strohmeyer and Brother Leon, whom the scholarship is named for, that we met back in the 90s. And I'm so glad for the continued support that we have through the foundation there to be a blessing and a help to our seniors each and every year. And with that in mind, I would announce in 2017, we awarded that scholarship of $10,000 to one young man, James Shadimu, from Nigeria. This May... He will be graduating from Pensacola Christian College with his bachelor's degree. And I'm so happy, so proud for James. And I hope that he can be back here soon and just maybe stand in front of you and give a word of testimony. You know, there was a lot of headaches with the international ministry. And there was a lot of blessings with the international ministry. But to see that after these four years, since it's been kind of closed down, how the Lord is still working in the lives of people is really a blessing. And James surely has been an encouragement and a help through all these years. So if you pray for him as he goes forward, not sure what the Lord's going to do with his life, but who knows? He's got the tools now to go forward, and we're trusting God to do great things in his life. All right, let's have the kids come down, and they can do their Bible verses tonight. Come on down, young peoples. Thank you, Brother Nick. It is so good to see these young people. Even the teenagers are still doing it. All right, Madison, would you get us started with a Bible verse, please? I will lift up my eyes and choose the ones coming in my house. My help coming from the Lord. Amen. 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 <laughs> he, she didn't want to say any more. James 1 8. The double minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's right. Amen. Exodus twenty thirteen, thou shalt not kill. Right. Amen. James one eight, a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Amen. Amen. James one eight, a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Amen. Y'all must have learned that in Sunday school this morning. Genesis six eight, no fun grace in the eyes of it. That's right, it did. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Amen. <laughs> Proverbs five five. Is her feet go down to no her feet go down to death his her feet, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Amen. Amen. Let brotherly love continue. That's right. Amen. Let brotherly love continue. Very good. Hold up your money. If they're coming to get money to put back in the little uh, tube up here and the piggy bank thing, uh, that's for Bible tracts and Bibles, Bible materials. So if you've got money, hold that up and wave it. My wife has some over there, Braley. If you'll get it from Miss Sellers, Braley. Good, good, good. Thank you, Todd. Fold it four ways to Sunday now and put it in there. Good. Good, good. That's right. Come on, kids. You youngers are good for something. Any more money you want to wave? Woo! There's three bucks to all at one time. Man, a lie. More and more and more. Come on. Come on, Addie. Yeah, let me take We'll take it. We'll take dollar bills, fives, twenties. We had a little uh, scavenger hunt in chapel the other day, and one of the things was a $2 bill. Well, everybody looked around, and I pulled one out of my wallet. 
and I gave it to that team, and that team happened to win. So if you, we'll even take a $2 bill. Anybody here know who's on the $2 bill? Very good, Jefferson. Did you know Bob Jefferson? Good. All right, put them in there. We'll take that. We like the ones with Grant on them there, though. We prefer those. So, Ben Franklin, we'll take that too. Thank you. Can you get it in there? Any more? All right, there's some more money. Come on up. All right, while they're doing that, any adults want to say a Bible verse tonight? Any of you adults want to say a verse this evening? Miss Sellers? Amen. Miss Dever? Amen. Anybody else? Let's... Amen. Very good. Thank you, Brother Sidney. Someone else? Miss Sandra. Amen. Very good. Encouragement. Somebody else? Miss Angie. Amen. Somebody else? Deborah? Oh, good. Well, not right now. You know how easy it is to tell people it's going to be all right when it ain't you in the bed? Oh, my goodness. But, yeah, we say the same thing, and I'm trusting. And, but I would feel like if his mama tells him that, that's got to be an uplifting encouragement. And to think that when he gets that fixed and he gets the auction like he needs, he's going to feel good so much better, so much better. Anyone else? Leah? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Miss Rosemary. I'm planning on singing next week, by the way. Yes, I am. Amen. Aren't you glad? Anyone else? Brother Nick, you got one you want to share? Amen. Very good. How about uh, Proverbs 7, 2? Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. Thank God for his word. Amen. Brother Nick, come lead us in another song. Let's all stand. This is our hand-waving song, 575 is what we're going to sing. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from take your Bibles. We're still in Psalm 119, and so I hope you're still getting a blessing from it. If nothing else, you're learning and seeing something you've never seen, because most Christians don't pay any attention to these superscriptions in their Bible. Psalm 119, we'll be putting in at verse number 73 tonight, and the little word, which is a letter of the Hebrew alphabet right above Psalm 73, is the word yod, or yud. And so you pronounce that J like you would a Y in our language, and it would fall in that category, either a Y or an I in our English alphabet. 
So verse 73 down through verse number 80, we'll read them together, and then we'll look at our screen, and we'll go forward from there. Yod, verse 73, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Let, I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to thy word unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. Our Father, thank you for your word tonight. Bless it to our hearts and minds. We've, we trust you bless the reading of it. Oh Lord, we pray that you bless the planting of it, the seed of the word of God in our heart to draw us ever closer to you, to help our walk with thee, to be that which will bring glory and honor to you. Stir us up this month. Get us out of our comfort zone. Help your word to speak to us now in these moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll put in right here, just by way of review, let's look at these letters here that are up here on our screen. We'll take a look at them together. Of course, the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. There's 22 sections. Make sure I'm turned on here. There we go. I think that'll get it. All right, I'm clicking, and it's not clicking, Eric, so you can help me out a little bit. The first is Aleph. This is the symbol, the pictogram. There we go, of an ox with horns representing that leadership and power. Secondly... We have the uh, second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that is Beth, as in Bethel, or Bethlehem. That word means house, particularly a shelter, an open tent-like, or a spiritual house. Thirdly, we have the third letter here is Gimel, which is like a camel, and that is the idea of that beast of burden that bows down on his knees to bear the load. And certainly, after we know the Lord and His power and leadership, and we get in His house, it's a good thing to serve God. Don't you agree with me? That's a good thing when people get right with God, they get in church, and they just sit down and do nothing. No. Once they get in church, we all need to serve the Lord. Everybody can do something for the cause of Christ. Fourthly, we have daylift. This means a door. And of course, that's like the door or the door flap that would be on the tent of the Bedouin pilgrims of the Bible days. Remember, Abraham was looking for a city whose builder maker is God. He never really found that place till he graduated to heaven. So he lived in tents as a pilgrim here and there, and that's what that symbolizes. Next, we have hay. Now, hay symbolizes, or in the pictogram here of the letter of the Hebrew alphabet, is, a, is like a lattice or a window. And you surely can see with the shape of the house there, and there's a window that, he, that lets light in and allows us to be able to see out. Jesus is the light of the world. You will not see right until you learn to see things through his eyes. Next, we have this letter, the word Bob. This is like a stake or a peg, or a nail, something that connects one thing to another or allows that established fact to be there. Something in the ground that you can tie off to and connect to or to put two boards together to put those things together, this nail or peg. Then we have Zion. This is symbolized by a sword, a weapon, or a scepter. And that, of course, indicates a symbol of sovereign power. And that is our God and our Lord, Jesus Christ, because He is the power of God. Then we have ket, and this ket is a doorway, not a door, but a doorway, an opening, a cased opening, we would call it in our day in America, and this is an entrance, a doorway. Remember how this reflects on the New Testament when Jesus said in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. What is the way to God? It is through Jesus, it's not through Buddha. It's not through uh, Mohammed or Confucius or Allah. It is through Jesus. He is the only way. Then we had Tet. This is an open container. This is the last one that we looked at, verses 65 through 72. This is an open container or a vessel. And we know the Lord wants clean vessels so that His Spirit can inhabit that vessel and be filled. we can be filled with God's Spirit and we can bear some fruit to His honor and to His glory. Now tonight we look at this one. Yod. This is a symbol that is identified with the word hand 
or hand in the Bible, in particular, the right hand. So Eric, if you'll just leave that up there uh, for now, and we'll go forward from there and look at our scriptures that are found for us in these verses. Notice with me in verse number 73, we actually are introduced to the idea of the hand. And it says here, thy hands have made me. Now I'm going to come back to that in a moment because I want you to turn in the New Testament with me to a verse of Scripture that I know you're probably aware of, but we want to connect it with this little yod. Turn to Matthew chapter number 5 in the New Testament. Matthew chapter number 5. And notice with me a particular verse that is found here. Let's start in verse 17, and let me read verse 17 and 18. Jesus says this, this is his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He's preaching, if you have a red letter Bible, it's even in red writing here. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The yod that we see in Psalm 119 is the same as that jot that's mentioned there. Now on this screen up here, it looks pretty big, but actually in Hebrew writing, if you ever read or see Hebrew written, it's something that is smaller than our apostrophe that's just written up and above by a letter. And then the tittle that is mentioned right here is the difference in just one line, say on the bottom of the letter, going just a tiny bit further. So what this is saying is even the smallest, most simple letters and grammatical parts of the Hebrew language, those things will not pass away. We think God's Word's important. It is. We think certain books of the Bible are important. They are. We think certain verses are really valuable. They are. But even commas and periods and apostrophes and even the jots and tittles, even the little yods are important because they're a part of God's holy word. And this is one of the indicators here. This jot or this yod, go back to Psalm 119 now if you would. That yod is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And also, of course, the tittle is the smallest extra marking that might be made to a particular letter. And I'll show you that in succeeding weeks that go around. Now again, this is ind indicative of the hand. In particular, not just a hand, but the right hand. Because that's the hand of God's power. That's the hand of God's authority. That's the hand of responsibility before the Lord. That is the hand, that right hand, is the one in which is mentioned many times to establish the position and the rank of an honored individual. So the person to my right hand would be the first choice. The person to my right hand would be the chosen one. The person to my right, uh, that on my right hand would be the anointed one. I want to show you that in some verses that are found in Psalms also. Look back at Psalm 110, if you would. Psalm 110. And notice with me, if you would, in verse number 5. Psalm 110 and verse number 5. Here's what the Bible says. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. That shows God's power to execute judgment. It's the Lord at His right hand. Now understand this, God the Father, and who is at the right hand of God the Father? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me show you another one. You're, let's turn to the New Testament now. Turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. Matthew chapter number 24, and we'll see again how this right hand of God is involved in the power, the authority, and the exercise thereof. When you get to Matthew 24, look at verse number 64. And when you get there, would you say an amen? Here's what the Bible says. 24. Notice with me here if you would. I'm in the wrong chapter. Hold up. I'm in the wrong chapter. Back up just a moment. Back up just a moment. Let's go, let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. I can show you right there. It's a repeat of it anyway. Hebrews chapter number 1. Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 3. Here's what the Bible says. 
Most of you have probably even memorized part of the book of Hebrews, but I think it's important to see this in chapter 1, verse number 3. Speaking of Jesus Christ, who, being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had, when he had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You heard about the little girl that was in Sunday school, and she said she knew that God was left-handed. When the teacher said, how do you know? said, because it says that Jesus was sitting on his right hand, so he had to be left-handed. Well, that's not true. Uh, the power, the authority, the responsibility, the position of rank and power is the right hand. Hebrews chapter 12. I know you know this one. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The first time that you read about God's hand is in Genesis chapter one, chapter 3, verse 22, when God's hand formed man and provided for him even the coats of skins that covered the sins of Adam and Eve, and that God's hand barred Adam and Eve from ever going back into the Garden of Eden. But what we read here is a whole different level of showing not just God's hand in creation and the garden, but God's hand in power, authority, position and responsibility. Let me put it this way. Who do you want to be in authority? You want the current administration that's in Washington? I don't even want the previous generation in authority or the administration in authority. If we're talking about having dominion and power and authority over the whole world, not just a country, not just a nation, not just a continent, but imagine someone with the immense power to rule the world. According to my Bible, the only one justified to be that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. That position of power and authority. And that's who Jesus is. The right hand of God's power. The right hand of God's authority. The right hand of God's righteous judgment. It is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we think of Yod and we think of the hand, we're thinking particularly of the right hand. But there was another note by one fellow I read after and he said this. It's not just a hand. Now when I speak of, think about it. When I speak of power and authority and judgment and ruling... Don't you kind of think of just what I'm holding up to you? A balled up hand fist? In other words, it's God's power. So we look at him to punch the lights out on the old devil. The brother Roloff used to call brother, uh, old uh, Slewfoot the devil. I believe he's got that power. And I believe God can knock the socks off of anybody he needs to to get the enemies out of our life. Time or two, I felt like he's gone one upside my head. How about you? When he kind of did something to get our attention. But I'm here to say tonight that this word is more than just a fist of power. But the Bible speaks of it this way, as an open hand. So here's the right hand of power, responsibility, authority, rulership. Holding that great scepter of power. But then take that hand and open it up. And now all of a sudden, that hand that looked fearful and scared us is now an open hand to welcome us in and to bring us in. I don't know about you, but I kind of like that kind of stuff. I like to see in these little things that we find in this alphabet more than just a letter. You see, if I go to a kindergarten kid and I say the letter A, they know what I'm talking about. But they also know that it has a sound. It's not just look like an A capitalized, but it says I, I, apple, or A, A, and cake, or whatever they use now. But they also can imagine that picture of A, 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 apple, or B, 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 bell, a cat. And as they sound out, the, I'm not stuttering, by the way, uh, as they sound those things out, they have different images that come to their mind. Well, when I say hand to you, biblically, I say, what does the hand of God mean to you in the Bible? Well, he used his hand and created the universe. Well, is that as far as you go? How about this? I hope when I say hand to you and I say something out of the Bible, I hope you think about his right hand. And when you think about his right hand, I hope you think about Jesus seated at the right hand of God who by himself purged our sins. I hope you think of his fist, his hand of power. But I also hope you think of his open hand that said, come on, let me 
have your hand and I'll walk you right in. Listen, when we land as the stories go at St. Peter's Gate, we're not looking to walk up there and barge in or convince Peter we deserve to be there. But I got a feeling rather than seeing Peter, I ain't planning on looking for him no how. I'm planning on seeing Jesus who with an open hand. And don't you think about it this way when our loved ones leave this life to go to the other side. Don't you think about graduating from here to glory though the angels bear our souls up. Don't you know when we arrive on heaven's bright shore, Jesus is there to welcome us with an open hand. You even think about it. We do it at church every Sunday when somebody walks in that door back there and we're welcoming them. We don't ball our fist and say, what are you doing here? At least I hope you're not doing that. Brother Curtis would scare me to death if as a greeter out front, he said, glad y'all are here. I mean, again, he looks like Hulk Hogan, so I don't know what would happen. But that warm, open hand of a handshake reaching out welcomes people and says, come on in. That's what the hand is. Now to break the verses down, we'll look at the first three or four verses. Verse 73, 74, and 75. And we will take that word hand in verse no, hands in verse 73. Thy hands have made me. Now one of the great things you do when you study your Bible is do a thing called cross-referencing or comparing Scripture with Scripture. This is how you learn the Bible. You don't compare your Bible with what somebody else said and decide just whether or not they're right. Because you could get confused that way because somebody will read their own private interpretation to what a verse says. What you do is you can't compare verse with verse. Now when this says, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Let me tell you where my mind goes and I want you to go there. Psalm 139. And we're going to compare Scripture with Scripture. What possibly could David have been speaking of when he said, Lord, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Well, I think he's talking about the Lord making him. Psalm 139. And notice with me verse 13 through 16. Here's what the Bible says. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Verse 16, thine eyes did see my substance. That's even at conception. This is what this is talking about. Yet being imperfect, I wasn't completely formed into a child. But we know that life begins at conception. That's what this is describing. In the womb, hidden parts. Goes on to say in verse 16, and in thy book all my members, fingers, toes, hands, arms, eyes, ears, mouth, nose, all my members written in thy book, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, let me suggest this. If you're still wrestling with whether or not life begins at conception, if you're still trying to figure out, did God make us or are we here by evolution? Is the Big Bang the way it went or was God's hand of creation involved? If you're still wrestling with the idea of did God do it or did it just happen, you're never going to grow as a Christian. At some point, you've got to accept by faith, which by the way, is what evolutionists try to get you to do. They don't have the proof. It's the theory. When I was a kid, it was the theory of evolution. And without any facts coming out, it's now considered the fact of evolution. I'm going to tell you right now, it's a lie of evolution. You can't believe the Bible and accept evolution. Theistic evolution is the idea that God, theistic, evolved us. In other words, He used evolution to bring us about. And I know many Christians that bind to that idea. I just happen to think they're crippled at the neck. The elevator doesn't go all the way to the top. God did not use the means of going through. If He created us, as the Bible says in Genesis, either it happened that way or it didn't. And if it did, God is right. And if it didn't, God's a liar. He created man of the dust of the earth and he took a rib out of man and he fashioned a woman and they were created not as little tadpoles or amoebas that evolved up through the monkey stage and finally became a man or a woman. They were created by a direct act of God just as surely as he said, let there be light and there was light. We have a God who used his hands and that's what David says. He says this, not only is power and authority at your right hand, but you used your hands and you made me. 
It'd be a good day in your life and mine when you recognize this. Psalm 100 verse 3 says this, that God hath made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. You see, God formed and shaped you. We're all different. We have different fingerprints, different numbers of hairs on our head. We have different footprints. We have different DNA. We are all different. And that began at creation or at conception in our case. It began at conception when God began to form us. Well, what significant does that have? Just the whole idea of being opposed to evolution? No. There's not a one of us that are alike. You see, God made you and God made me and He threw the mold away. Even identical twins aren't identical. Their mamas can tell them apart. Their daddies can tell them apart. I don't know that I could with some we've had at our school, but I know this much. Even if everything about them physically is right, they're different on the inside. They think differently. They feel differently. They have different interests, similar but different. It's interesting to see that. So I'm saying this. If you'd realize that when God made you in your mother's womb, He fashioned you and He used His hands to formulate who you would be, what you would look like, whether you're tall or short, whether you're thin or a little bit wider, or whether you're super intelligent and a genius, or whether you have to struggle with some things. It doesn't matter. God made you for a purpose. He's got a unique purpose and reason in your life why He made you the way He did. Some of us, God gave, well, not me, but some of y'all, God gave special gifts and talents that are beyond my scope and scale to do. Singing as an example, I try, glad to do it. God gives different people different things. I don't know that if I worked with Miss Lori for a month of Sundays, I'd learn the piano. But God formed and shaped her so she'd be able one day to pick up that, use that talent and ability. She can't just play the piano, she can fly a plane. And thirdly, she puts up with Michael. This is a miracle woman sitting right here. Not to mention the young and she has to deal with, but just putting up with him. See, God made us all different. I don't know that I would have fit in the military, but some of y'all did. But it was a career, a life for you. But that's not for everybody. God shapes, molds, and makes us to be just what he wants us to be. And that's a part of seeing the Lord's hand in making us. And in motivating us, he even talks about here that he wants his heart and mind stirred by God's commandments and by God's statutes. And then further, if you look in those verses, and we'll read them together, in the last part of verse number 73, he said, Give me understanding. That's a motivation he wants, that I may learn thy commandments. It wasn't, well, you know, the Lord made me, and I'm happy. That's all I need to know. No, you need to know more. You need to grow in His Word, learn and understand and comprehend His commandments. Verse 74, They that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hath afflicted me. God didn't just make him and motivate him. God molded him into the man that he was. Now listen, not everybody was a little shepherd boy who could sit out in the field and defend his sheep from a lion and a bear. And long before he ever fought Goliath, he had to fight that lion and that bear. God shaped and molded David in his life as he grew up. Not just in the womb and birth, but as he went on in life as an adolescent, as a teenager, as a young man. So that one day he could become the king of all of Israel. Now, whether you like Ronald Reagan whether you like Donald Trump or you like some other president along the way, you have to realize this. Go back in history to an Abraham Lincoln. About everybody likes Lincoln. If you've ever read the story behind his life or the story behind someone like George Washington, you realize they didn't just go through the process of conception and birth and a little baby. They grew up in a lot of other things and people influenced their life so Washington could become General Washington and later the first president of the United States so that Lincoln wouldn't just be a log splitter in Illinois. He would grow up to be a president who would sign the Emancipation Proclamation and various other things. And you can see in that how God works in everybody's life to shape and mold them through the things that happen in your life. Can you remember back, maybe it was a teacher in elementary school that had an impact on your life. God used that person to shape you and mold you. Maybe it was a coach in high school. Maybe it was somebody, maybe a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a dad or a mom. Maybe it was a grandparent that had great influence on your life long after you've been born. 
Maybe it was a co-worker, a neighbor that came in, a good friend that you got really close to, and that friend and their way of life and their influences and their words were an encouragement and a help to you. Most of you know how much of a, a friend to me that Brother Dean Herring is. I didn't know Brother Dean as a young boy. I didn't know him as a teenager. We met accidentally, I believe it was providential, in Tifton, Georgia. I drove up from Moultrie, about 30 miles. He drove, uh, well, we met in Macon. Let me take that back. I was in Tifton. I went there, met a friend. We rode up to Macon, Georgia, and in Macon we met in 1979. We met. I'm already pastoring a church in Moultrie, Georgia. He's assistant pastor at a church in Jessup, Georgia, New Testament Baptist Church, and that's when we met. I could not tell you the amount of influence that that man had on my life and still has that God used him. Can I name another one? Earl Dormany. Can I name another one? The chemical engineer known as Joe Chancy. I would add him in that bunch. I would add Dr. James Rushing. You know any of these names? Dr. Raymond Hancock. I can name it Dr. Joe Bryant. Many of these people that you know, and literally, Brother Jimmy Leverett, my pastor, I mean, these, these people had an influence on my life. But I can't leave my mom and daddy out. I can't leave my grandparents out. See, there's a whole lot of people that contributed to my life to help shape and mold me to be who I am. I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not everything I should be. But I tell you what, in the world would I be if I hadn't had the influences that God's hands directed into my life and God used them to shape and make and mold me. And I bet you God used people like that in your life too. You ought to thank Him and you ought to praise Him for the people He brought across your path because they were used as His hand to help shape, mold, and make you. Not only do we see in Psalm 119, these verses, 73 to 75, the hand of the Lord. But don't you see, secondly, don't you see the heart of the Lord. Look at verse 76 and 77. All of God's power and creation in shaping, molding, and making us does not save us. You've got to go a little further. Verse 76 says, Let I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort. According to thy word and to thy servant, let thy tender mercies come to me that I may live, for thy law is my delight. So I see here God's heart in the merciful kindness and the tender mercies that are mentioned in those two verses. You see, God's hand sculpted out the oceans and piled up the mountains. And God's hand flung the stars in the black velvet of heaven. And God's hand brought down powerful judgment. But at the cross of Calvary, it wasn't God's hand of power and authority. At Calvary, when Jesus died, it was God's heart on display. Can God do anything as powerful as anybody could? Yes. He's an almighty, omnipotent God. But that doesn't save. A powerful God, a creating God, doesn't save. You've got to go a step further. And that's a passionate God who provides salvation through His own shed blood on the cross of Calvary when Jesus died for us. You see, it's God's heart on display. And we need to understand that. And it is at the cross and through the blood that mercy is applied. Do you remember in the Old Testament, there was a piece of furniture that was a part of the tabernacle in the wilderness and later the temple in Jerusalem. And that thing was called the Ark of the covenant. Most people in this generation know about Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Well, that ark is the biblical ark of the covenant. It's an oblong box, and inside that box was Aaron's rod that budded, a copy of the Ten Commandments in stone written with the finger of God that were not broken, and a pot of manna. What do those things symbolize? Well, first of all, the pot of manna is heavenly bread. Jesus is the bread of life. Commandments that are not broken, the only one that didn't break any commandments was Jesus. The unbroken law of God is symbolized in the person of Jesus Christ. And then also Aaron's rod, a stick, a dead stick that springs forth in life. Resurrection. And so in those three items in the ark symbolizes the Lord Jesus Christ. But that box had a lid. It had a top. And that top was made out of solid gold. And in gold, solid gold represents pure deity. 
not humanity and deity, just all deity. And on the ends of that lid were cherubims with their wings pointing in at each other from each end. And on the surface of that lid is where the high priest went in once a year on the Day of Atonement and sprinkled the blood of a spotless lamb. And on that place where the blood was shed is called the mercy seat. Here is God's tender mercies. Here is God's merciful kindness. How do we get it? We get it through the blood that was shed of Jesus. The mercy of God cost the Father the blood of His only dear Son. Alan Redpath, if you ever get any books by Alan Redpath, he was one time uh, pastor of the Moody Memorial Church in Chicago, Illinois, where D.O. Moody has been memorialized. But Alan Redpath has some great books. He has Victorious Christian Living yeah, on the book of Joshua, Victorious Christian Service, on the book of Nehemiah, two great books. You will be blessed to read them. He said this, he called the mercy of God, God's weak point. God's weak point. I wouldn't think God had a weak point. He just coined that phrase. What he meant was as powerful and stern and as coming down with judgment and wrath as God must be, for God is a holy God and will not so much as look upon sin. And yet when you plead for mercy, his heart breaks and he gives it. Turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Let me show you an example of this real quick. Luke chapter 18, verse number 9, when Jesus spake a parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. This is Luke 18, verse 9. And he spake this parable in the certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. A publican was a hated tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. What did the publican plead for? Justice? No, he's guilty. He doesn't want judgment. He doesn't want wrath. He pleads for mercy. What's the best thing you can do, I guess, when you're guilty and before a judge, throw yourself on his mercy? I can't... Sure you that every earthly judge will give it to you, but I can assure you this. If you throw yourself on the mercy of God, it's his weak point. He'll give in to you. Now that's not mercy so you can go sin again. That's not mercy so you can repeat bad behavior. That's not mercy so you can do it over and over and repetitiously again in a practicing lifestyle that is violating God's law. But it is this, when we come with our heart broken, this publican smote it was a sign of the Jewish people when they did that, that they are accepting the judgment of God upon their heart and life. I deserve to be stricken and punished, but God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. I'll tell you this much. He might not have prayed the sinner's prayer. He didn't say Jesus. He didn't say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. But I know from what Jesus said, this man got saved. He went down to his house justified. He did it the right way. God, have mercy on me. Back to Psalm 119, it says tender mercies, and then it says merciful kindness. Those two things are mentioned. So we see the Lord's hand, we see the Lord's heart. Thirdly and finally, we see the Lord's help. Verse 78 down to verse 80, Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause. Sounds like some people were after him. We do know Saul tried to kill him on more than one occasion. We know that his son Absalom sought to kill him too and ran him out of Jerusalem. And David had to live in Hebron while Absalom was ruling in Jerusalem. What a terrible thing to not just have the enemies turn on you, but even have family turn on you. 
Maybe you've been in that position before where you feel like, man, nobody's my friend. Everybody has turned on me. Well, that's what David knew. And so he's calling out for God, the end of verse 20, uh, 78, but I will meditate in thy precepts. He's asking for God to help. He wants to find some help. He knows the situation might not change, but he wants some comfort and help from the Word of God. Verse 79, Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. This is, he wants to, if he's got to fight against people that came against him for no reason at all, he wants to be able to fight successfully. Furthermore, he wants to be able to fellowship with other people that love the Word of God. See, he said, bring them to me that fear you. Let me hang out with that group. Let me run with the right crowd. How many times have we heard this growing up? And I guarantee you, even this younger generation has heard it. Birds of a feather flock together. You can tell who you are and what kind of character you got by the people you hang out with. If you hang around and hang out with the people that are always using God's name in vain, getting drunk, doing all kinds of wickedness in the world, more than likely you're at least sympathetic toward that way or you don't have the backbone to stand up against it. God's people ought to be separate and peculiar and we don't participate in certain lifestyle choices that people have. Listen, if you want to show up at every rainbow uh, gay pride uh, parade in America, help yourself. But I ain't hanging out with that crowd. I'm afraid they might identify me with them. Some folks I ain't hanging out with just because I don't want to be identified with them. It doesn't, doesn't mean I don't love and care for them. It doesn't mean I don't want to see them saved. Everybody that hangs out at the bar on Saturday night, I'd love to see them saved, but I'm not going to go hang out at the bar with them. You don't win the loss by acting like them or becoming them. Oh, I'm, you're going to become a queer to win a queer? Help yourself. I don't think that's right. But we, what we've done in America is we've swallowed the idea that if you stand against the sin and the perverted behavior, you don't love and care about people. And some people have shown that by their attitude. Listen to me, it doesn't matter if it's the lesbian crowd, the gay crowd, or whatever name you want to give to them, and I don't like to go into all of that. But whatever it is, you've got to understand this, they still need to be loved, they still need to be reached, they still need Jesus Christ, and still need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? I got them in my family, you got them in your family, you may work with them, and they may be people that you don't approve of their lifestyle. I would say this much, love them, pray for them, but don't participate in what they participate in. Don't involve yourselves in that crowd. I love the, listen, people hooked on crack, I love them, want to see them saved, but I ain't smoking crack to try and win them. This is ridiculous. We, but we live in that kind of world. Be like them to win them. Dress like them, act like them, talk like them. Can you imagine that? Use God's name and every four-letter dirty word in the world because you want to win people? Oh, no. You stand up for the Lord and say, no, we don't talk like that. My, I don't talk like that. My family don't talk. We don't participate in that. And sometimes there has come that moment in your life and mine when you decide to live for God. And you know what will happen? Your friends, your friends, you'll find out who they really are. Because you take a stand and live for God, go to church faithful like y'all do, and before long, some folks you thought was friends don't want nothing to do with you because you're not partying with them. You're not doing what they do. By the way, if it's good for teenagers to hang out with the right friends, it's good for adults to hang out with the right kind of friends. You're welcome. The Lord's help is needed when we have to fight. The Lord's help is needed when we need the right kind of fellowship and finally, to be sound in our faith. The last part of verse, well, let's just read all of verse 80. Let thy heart be sound let my heart be sound in thy statutes. Sound doesn't mean here a sound you hear. This is a word used in the New Testament, sound doctrine. It means whole, healthy, strengthened, good. So what we need when we believe the Bible is sound doctrine. It's not enough just to believe something in the Bible. You've got to believe the right things and you have to believe them right. We have somebody that's been visiting our church. I won't tell you who it is. But somebody has been visiting our church over the last little while who was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. Now they're coming here. They did not have a sound faith in the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall. But here they get a sound faith preached and taught to them. There are people, there, there's somebody that's a member of our church. You don't, some of y'all don't even know who I'm talking about. That used to be a Mormon. Raised in the Mormon church, not sound, false teaching. Now they're saved, they're a member of our church. Sound, healthy, 
beliefs. Clear, when I say doctrine, I mean Bible teaching. The beliefs that are in the Bible. Sound doctrine, sound faith, healthy beliefs, healthy teaching from the Word of God. And that is really what we want from His hand. Every time we come to church, God's hand is here to meet out to us whatever we need. Bob's tired. I should be through preaching by now. Okay? God bless you. But anyway, aren't you glad that God's hand will provide for us? If you believe that, say amen. Stand up, we'll have a word of prayer. Well, we're a family, and I'm glad that we are, and we're looking forward to a good time right after church this evening. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Bless it to our hearts and minds. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for a hand that is powerful enough to make us, a hand that is merciful enough to save us, and a hand that is always there to provide help and nourishment and comfort and strength when we need it. We give you glory, honor, and praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Miss Lori's going to just play a one verse of invitation. If you need to come, you come tonight. Thank you, Miss Lori. Aren't you glad he'll save us and he'll use us? We'll be dismissed in just a moment. I need to meet with Brother Sidney and Brother Curtis right up here in front, right after church tonight. If you'd meet with me, please. And the rest of you can make your way on around, and we'll have some good fellowship with Brother Earl. You're dismissed. God bless you.